Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Berkeley Center for New Media, the Arts, Technology and Culture Colloquium. My name is Clancy Wilmot, and I'm an assistant professor in geography in the Berkeley Center for New Media, an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. Tonight's event is generously co-sponsored by the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation, the Arts Research Center and Media Studies. Uh, our Art, Technology and Culture Colloquium, founded in 1997 by Ken Goldberg, is an internationally respected forum for creative ideas. Free and open to the public, it presents leading artists, writers and critical thinkers who question assumptions and push boundaries at the forefront of multiple intersecting fields. Before we begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that we are bringing this event to you tonight from the territory of Hu Chin, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chichenya speaking Ohlone people, specifically the confederated villages of Oshon. The history of prolific technological development in this region, as in every region, has always depended on the land and all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place to the, here today on and in relation to this land. At BCNM, we commit to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone people through building long-term reciprocity and a relationship with tribal leaders and organizations. Uh, so we invite everyone to participate by responding to tonight's lecture in the chat or in the Q&A portion. Uh, and we ask that attendees help us maintain an inclusive, respectful and harassment free space. Attendees who violate any of these guidelines will be removed from the event and may be disallowed from future online events. If you are new to our events, please read our community agreements and we'll share a link to those in the chat. I also want to mention that we have captions available if you'd like to turn them on. So tonight, I'm very excited. I am honored to introduce our speaker, Dr. Natrice Gaskins. Dr. Natrice Gaskins is an African-American digital artist, academic, cultural critic, and advocate of STEAM fields. In her work, she explores the techno-vernacular creativity of Afrofuturism. Dr. Gaskins teaches, writes fabs, and makes art using algorithms and machine learning. She has taught multimedia, visual art, and computer science with high school students. She earned a BFA in computer graphics with honors from Pratt Institute in 1992, and an MFA in art and technology from the School of Art Institute of Chicago in 1994. She received a doctorate in digital media from Georgia Tech in 2014. Dr. Gaskin's first full length book, Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation is available through the MIT Press. Gaskin's AI generated artworks can be viewed in journals, magazines, museums, and on the web. Gaskins served as board president of the National Alliance for Media Arts and Culture, or the Alliance, and was on the board of Community Technology Centers Network, CTC Net. She's currently on the board of Artisans Asylum. So I hope you'll join me even virtually and silent because of this forum in welcoming Dr. Gaskin. Thank you, Clancy. And um, good morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time it is where you're at. I'm going to share my screen now and get started. Okay, so um, I want to talk about generative art. Let me go back. And so really this entire uh, presentation is going to look at the history of generative art and deep learning AI, because they're very tied together, but you're talking about the span of over 55 years. So I have to uh, mix in the history as well as the work that I've been doing, uh, because I think it's all relevant. So um, generative art is um, basically output of a system like a computer, makes its own decisions about a piece of work rather than a human. Um, system can be simple as a single Python program, as long as it has rules and some aspect of randomness. Um, it emerged on the heels of modern art um, genres like cubism, dataism, surrealism, and it celebrates the chaos and serendipity of its modern predecessors. Okay. And central to generative art is the manipulation of systems to produce something random and unique. So again, the ran randomness and the uniqueness is what makes generative art what it is. So a, a generative artist designs the system using language rules, machines, algorithms, um, or genetic sequences to generate a final product that serves um, as a work of art. Harold Cohen is one of the pioneers of generative art 
and um, he used computer controlled robots to generate paintings in the late 1960s. So um, I'm gonna show a video that uh, is him speaking about his work. And so you're talking about the early days of generative art um, in the 1960s and 70s. And again, this is for some historical um, connection to topic. I write programs, programs make drawings. Drawings are made completely by the computer. This isn't the case of computer-aided art making. Harold Cohen has been an artist and computer scientist for over 20 years. I talked with him in his studio in San Diego on the University of California campus, where he has developed his own expert system to create original art. computer being creative? I think creativity is a relative term. It, it, clearly the machine is being creative. The program is being creative to the degree that every time it does a drawing, it does a drawing that nobody's ever seen before, yeah. including me. I don't think it's currently as creative as I am in writing the program. I, I think for, for a program to be fully creative, in a more complete sense creative, it has to be able to modify its own performance, and that's a very difficult problem. The computer creates original art based on rules that Harold Cohen programs. Rules that enable the computer to draw a variety of pictures that are different each time they are drawn. The pictures can be abstract art or a composition with figures that represent natural objects and people. Does it surprise you that a set of even a thousand rules can then create uh, really fine art yes it really does I, I sometimes find myself looking at one of the drawings and thinking you must come on who are you kidding really a computer did that <laughs> <laughs> you're in good health but someday when you're gone this computer can keep creating original drawings yeah I, I've, I've always i've always said that i'll be the first artist in history who could have a posthumous exhibition of new work um so <laughs> Okay, so that is Harold Cohen talking about his process and his work. Um, okay, back to the slideshow. And so we have some pioneers like Vera Molnar. Um, this is circa 2002. Um, on the left, we have George Knees and Schotter or Gravel, circa 1965. Um, I took some code into P5JS. JS stands for JavaScript and recreated Shotter from 1965. I did this yesterday. So this is a uh, Shotter via um, code in, two, in 2023, um, which you see on the right. Um, P5JS is a web editor and it's a JavaScript library and you can use it to generate art um, today, now, whenever you want to. And so um, I think it's really interesting that, you know, 1965 to, 2000, to 2023, and we still are able to do generative art, but now it's more accessible and anyone can kind of get in there and try it out. Um, urban uh, computing scholar, Malcolm McCullough, observed the emergence of computation as a medium and suggested a growing correspondence between digital work and traditional craft. He asserts that for a medium to be engaging, it has to also be dense and the medium must surround us in possibilities and it's through immersion that we can coax the medium from one state to another. I wanna further um, explore that. And here he's talking about touch. Um, I'm gonna to talk about that as it relates to AI art shortly. Um, so without touch in the meantime, perhaps we are stretching the call of direct manipula manipulation of craft. Um, the fact that traditional craft endures at all is because it satisfies a deep need for direct experience. And that's um, Malcolm McCullough. And so this is Leah Bookley. She is currently doing ceramics, but the design on the ceramics is computer code. So she creates the code like Hara Cohen, and then she 
um, prints out uh, laser etches um, the design and then presses that into clay and does these pots that you see here. Um, so this is code, but code is pottery or on pottery. Um, in Mind the Machine, artist Chantel Martin and computer scientist uh, Sarah Schwetman um, installed a robotic plotter that durationally performs new drawings generated by an algorithm while surrounded by 300 illustrations or templates that Martin created to train the algorithm. So she's training the machine. In other words, Martin was given a template and the drawings were made using the template and these drawings were used to train the AI. So what you see here at the top is Chantel's um, procedural drawings using pen and ink. She also used an iPad um, to create these um, drawings. She did 300 of them. And at the bottom is the machine attempting to create like Chantel based on the data it received from um, the artist. And so artist versus the machine here in this project. And this was, so I did an um, interview with, uh, and, and went to the show, and then I talked about to Chantel about doing a piece for Art21. So I wrote a piece um, in Art, uh, for Art21 and around 2018. And then two years later, Chantel had a chance to think about it and realized that she actually didn't have a good time in the collaboration. So she wrote, in the editor's note, she wrote a piece right before. So in December, 2020, a couple of years later, and two or three years later, she wrote this. And the part I want to highlight it here is um, she said, you know, she's an awful experience for her and an unhealthy collaboration because when all was said and done, her the collaborator on the project tried to use the project as an example for the rights of AI and move the needle away further away from the artist. And then she says, this is not only an antith antithesis of what she believes as an artist, but also what she believes as, in, as a human being. And she writes this to caution people who are curious to work in the realm of AI or deep learning. The tools can be, these tools can be powerful, but we need to make sure that the intentions and purposes behind these tools always remain as a source of support via a potential way in which artists and their further work is exploited. And again, this is just a couple, you know, three years ago now, um, and something that I had written in 2017, I believe, um, based on her show. And so there's some key words in there as it relates to the human versus the artist and also the collaboration between the artist and the machine. And in this case, uh, computer scientist, um, that's important to note. Like Leah Bickley and some of the other folks that I just showed, um, I've been exploring um, AI art and using laser engraving to do printmaking. So this is something that I did about three years ago where I took, um, I'll talk about Deep Dream Generator shortly on the left. And then I took that and um, prepared it in Photoshop and then brought it to the file to a laser cutter and engraved it into wood. Um, I actually engraved it into linoleum or wood. I did both and then uh, did traditional printmaking um, uh, with it, relief, pr relief printmaking with it, as you see here. So these are tests. These are some examples of me. Um, and I've also used laser engravers for metal and did something there where I was trying to use and do an intaglio print um, from the metal. But I was really trying to look at the differences between um, the, the image itself as a, just an image standalone on a computer screen and something that can actually be on paper or um, through artistic processes be print, printed on different materials. So Deep Dream Generator is a deep learning AI. And so that is a segue to this, which is to talk about what it is. It's the next level after generative art's been around for 40 years, um, 30, 40 years. Now we move into this deep learning phase. And it's the study and discipline of training neural networks um, it teaches computers to process data in a way that's inspired by the human brain. It is not the human brain. And so it is a machine. Artists build autonomous robots like Cohen, like Chantel Martin and Sarah Schwetman co to collaborate with, to feed algorithms with data and train machines to generate novel visual works. They work with computer programs that mimic the human mind to generate a never ending stream of unique artworks. And AI has emerged as a desirable collaborator in artistic creation, depending on who you talk to. Um, here's the history of this type of um, AI generation. And so GANs, or uh, we're gonna talk about that shortly, but um, that started in 2014 and that's the beginning of what we are talking about. And um, generative adversarial networks is the long 
um, long uh, phrase for it. Uh, Deep Dreams hit in 2015 with Google and they um, came up with Deep Dreams and I'll talk about that shortly. That moved into neural style transfer, which is one of my favorite applications of AI to make art. And that was in 2016, um, Akon uh, 2017, and of course, Dolly 2 in 2021 um, and Mid Journey in 2022. And now we're moving forward into other um, programs as you see. So this is Eva Sedenik and me, because I added Mid Journey in the slide. Um, and then there's a video by Vox and um, I only will only show just a little bit because it talks about the history, but it's a much longer video. So I will, um, if people want it, I can post um, the links to these YouTubes at the end, just let me know. But I do want to share um, this one, a little bit of this one because it's historical and I think it's very helpful to understand this generation of what's happening, both in terms of the aesthetic and also in terms of the technology and what it does in terms of space time and space. So I have this queued up and I have a, okay. Created image captioning, machine learning. Let me go back. Seven years ago, back in 2015, one major development in AI research was automated image captioning. Machine learning algorithms could already label objects in images, and now they learned to put those labels into natural language descriptions. And it made one group of researchers curious. What if you flipped that process around? We could do image to text. Why not try you know, doing text to image as well and see how it works? It was a more difficult task. They didn't want to retrieve existing images the way Google Search does. They wanted to generate entirely novel scenes that didn't happen in the real world. So they asked their computer model for something that it would have never seen before. Like all the school buses you've seen are yellow. But if you write the red or green school bus, would it actually try to generate something green? And it did that. It was a 32 by 32 tiny image. And then all you could see is like a blob of something on top of something. They tried some other prompts, like a herd of elephants flying in the blue skies, a vintage photo of a cat, a toilet seat sits open in a grass field, and a bowl of bananas is on the table. Maybe not something to hang on your wall, but the 2016 paper from those researchers showed the potential for what might become possible in the future. And, uh, the future has arrived. It is almost impossible to overstate how far the technology has come in just one year. By leaps and bounds. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, um, it's been quite dramatic. I, I don't know anyone who hasn't immediately been like, what is this? What is happening here? Can I say like wave crash, watching waves crashing? Okay. <laughs> Party hat guy. Sea foam dreams. A coral reef. Cubism. Caterpillar. A dancing tackle. My prompt is Salvador Dali painting the skyline of New York City. You may be thinking, wait. I'll stop there. Well, let me, yeah, I'll stop there. Um, and again, I can share this video with people who would like to check it out um, later and then keep going because there's more to talk about. So that's Vox um, created that video and put it out a few weeks ago. Um, so I talked about generative adversarial networks in 2014, and this is what it is. It generates images and other media based on underlying distribution of data. Um, Rafik Anadol, you see here his work um, on supervised machine hallucinations. He's kind of entered the art establishment and is in major museums at the moment. And his work looks similar to this. You see the scale of the human versus the um, art on the wall uh, in this image. So he's doing these large format, large mural sized or museum sized pieces based on GANs, which um, are very abstract mostly. And so GANs is the first step into what we know as AI art. And this is an example of that. Uh, then comes neural networks in 2015, a year later, Alexander Mordovinstev 
He worked at Google and found a way to plumb the hidden depths of a neural network and study how machines learn visual concepts. Then Google released the code and platforms such as Deep Dream Generator became available for public use. And um, around that time is when I discovered it and started to use it as a teaching um, tool for AP computer science principals in a high school. So as I mentioned, so in 2016, this is my first AI generated art using Deep Dream Generator. So this is 2016. Um, uh, at the time I was doing a lot of VJing. So I used images I created using Magic Music Visuals, which is a VI software tool, VJ software tool, music visualizer, <laughs> visualizer live video mixer, music video creator, et cetera. So Magic renders music into visuals. And so I took one of those visuals and brought it through De Deep Dream Generator and in 2016 and created this image. And this is the process. So the con so neural style transfer, what also is called deep style, optimizes um, images. It takes two images, a content image and a style reference image, such as an artwork by a famous painter and blends them together so that the output image looks like the content image, but painted in the style of the style reference image. So in short, there's a content image. So that's my music visual on the left. Then in the middle is the style image. And I was really into textiles and fabrics and um, which is textiles, but also just, just very abstract cultural designs and patterns. So I was using that as style images in my early uh, deep dream phase. Um, and then my final output, as you saw before in the previous slide is the first um, AI art that I made using this process of neural style transfer. Using AI, artists can produce images, short films, audio and video sequences, and more as every days, which is a practice of creating a new piece or more than one new piece each day. AI tools can generate dozens of initial thumbnails from which artists can choose the best ones to regenerate in high definition. Over time, these artists may have hundreds or thousands of images to work with. So just in Deep Dream Generator alone, I have 2000 images. Every day for 365 days in 2019, I produced uh, an image, at least one, and shared it on social media. Um, and sometimes I, in the top left image, I used a leap motion controller and created a, a, a code in uh, processing that generated these arrays. And then I used the output of that as a style image and used a photograph and then created um, the portrait. Other times it's stuff, uh, collage, digital collages in Photoshop. Um, sometimes it's other abstract images, it's textures. I'm really looking for um, textures and color and, and, and how that can enter, have a connection through the portraiture. And so the really cool thing is, um, as I started to, to make more and more of these every days, I started to learn more how deep the AI tool worked. And then my images improved, meaning they got clearer, they got more intentional. I was really, I felt adept and I felt very masterful in the use of um, the tool and it made me more confident. And I kept sharing work and, and, and learning as the machine learned. And so this is the early sort of the um, 2019 to 2020 phase of my um, exploring AI art. Um, so this is one of my early, on the left is one of my early AI art pieces using Deep Dream Generator. It's a student of mine um, from my time teaching um, at a STEAM lab. And so I used a photo that I into Deep Dream Generator, added a style reference image and produced the portrait you see here. Um, and that became a book. And, or the cover cover art for a book, which is my book, my first full length book, uh, Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation. And um, I actually didn't choose this image. It was chosen once the foreword was written by Leah Book Bookley, who you saw her ceramics earlier. She wrote the foreword about the AI art. The editor of the book wanted to know more about it and decided that we should uh, choose one of my pieces as the cover. So my work has been in museums, um, such as the Smithsonian. I had 11 of these totems in the Futures exhibition that um, closed in July of 2022. Um, one of the pieces is a self-portrait. In the middle is a book that's coming out this year um, through uh, uh, HarperCollins and with the author Ibi Zagoy. This is actually using 
three stock photos through and the publisher got the rights for me to use them. And so I created sort of what I call a Frankenstein, meaning there is no photograph like this because it's the combination of three different photographs of people. So the head is one photograph, the torso is another and the bottom part is another. Um, and I merged all that in Photoshop, then brought it to Deep Dream Generator and then did a series of that of, of output from Deep Dream Generator. And then I composited the output using Photoshop to get this image in the middle um, for the cover of the book. There's also murals. And so I did a portrait of Greg Tate who passed away in 2021. And I was commissioned by the uh, Mokata in Brooklyn to create this mural. And I can, you can actually see the scale of it. So now we're moving from this, the uh, image on the far left is about 64 inches tall and taller than me. Um, of course, the book is a normal size book and paperback book. And then you have the mural, which is over 25 feet. And um, I can show you, I have a walk up, a walkthrough, very brief. Uh, so you can actually see the mural. This is a p the mural going up. It took six hours. It's on vinyl and it's been up for over a year. And it will come down some at some point in April or in the spring of this year. See, I'm going to show you what that looks like. Okay, so there's the the video of the walkthrough of the mural as it currently is um, for people to see in downtown Brooklyn. And back here, how that came about is during the pandemic, I found that a lot of people that I either knew, I, I did know Greg Tate, um, I had his flyboy in the buttermilk as a student. Um, as a grad student in Chicago, and I've uh, met him. We lectured in the same um, events, and um, I knew when he passed away, I made a memorial image and put it on Instagram. His family and friends immediately responded and asked to use the image, and since then, it's been on stage at Lincoln Center. It's been a part of a second line of, um, celebration in uh, New York summer stage, and it was, it was on the cover of his celebration of life uh, as a kind of funeral program and uh, many other, um, and it's of course this mural. So um, this idea of memorializing people, of using AI, and I was able to do this um, pretty quickly. The image itself is a selfie by Greg Tate. He took of himself um, and his family uh, approved this image and was used many times. And again, using Deep Dream Generator. And now we move to the text to image uh, AI generators. So now um, that's not the same as Deep Dream Generator when you're talking about something totally different. And so when you're thinking about Dolly, Dolly or Image Journey, this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about Deep Dream Generator, which also now has a text to image, but that's another story. It uses AI to understand words and convert them to unique images. And models began to be developed in mid 2010s as a result of advances and deep neural networks. So still coming from the same umbrella of neural um, network uh, AI. And so this is an example from Dali, as you see here, the avocado chair. And then this is uh, some of what I did in mid journey every day. This is an old version of mid journey. So I would say this came out probably um, right when, you know, the, you know, six months into the mid journey, um, when it got released. And so mid journey runs off a of discord server. Dolly has its own Dolly two has its own platform. All, both of them take text and you write in prompts and then get these images generated. These are early ones. My everyday is from the early version of mid journey. And this was also from an early version of mid journey. Um, the text that I was inspired, I reinterpreted Tony Morrison's, um, if you surrender to the air, you could write it from my favorite book ever, Song of Solomon. And it produced this image, which is on the cover of Our Human Family. 
um, Shalom Rahman um, in 2022. So I was asked to take a mid-journey image and make it so that it wrapped around this magazine. And so what I did is I brought the mid-journey image into uh, Dolly 2 and used outpainting to extend the sky. So um, it would wrap around the magazine. So now I'm using two, deep, two um, AI tools for one image. So I use the journey with the Toni Morrison and reinterpretation of text, um, text prompts. And then I brought it into Dolly to, to extend the image, which is all possible using these tools. Um, this is a recent um, example. Um, it was the 23rd anniversary of Voodoo by D'Angelo, um, an album by D'Angelo and the song, The Root. And so I reinterpreted part of the lyrics for The Root and uh, brought that in, did that as text prompts in mid-journey. And then I brought it into Deep Dream Generator and used a um, like plant-based um, thing with roots and, and, and flowers and plant um, branches and things and used that as a style and then composited both in Photoshop. So this is kind of my current process moving from, I don't always reinterpret lyrics and things like that. It's just, sometimes it's just from my imagination, but this wasn't, I was inspired by the song and by of course the album and wanted to see what happened when you put the text in, reinterpreted the text in a way that Midjourney could uh, process. And so that is using two, no, actually three different tools Midjourney and Deep Dream Generator, both national national natural language processors and, and AI text to text to image tools. And then Photoshop is of course Photoshop, but it has its own neural filters, which I did not use for this image, but it has its own AI tools in it. So all three of these programs have AI features, including Photoshop. And this is the cyborg, I said cyborg, the Donna Haraway cyborg manifesto loosely inspired this series. Um, I was just really into the idea of cyborgs because we, you know, for me, I've always existed in tandem with technology because my mother was a computer programmer. So I grew up with someone in my house that was around computers for a job. And so she was doing computer programming when I was a baby. And so I was always uh, used to that and really into this idea of proliferation of technology. I really didn't get into um, using computer-based computer -based tools until high school and really late in high school where I majored in visual art. So it was a, my ceramics teacher that introduced me to um, computer graphics. So I actually learned from my, my analog art teacher who wanted one day to teach computer graphics. And then I took to that and it got me into the computer graphics program at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. But this idea of, of cyborgs and our connections to technology and how um, that interaction plays up both in, uh, internally, but also externally was inspiring these, this series of work. Um, if you've read my, my chapter in Afrofuturism 2.0, I talk about sem the semantic web, which is basically what's to come, what we've seen at neural networks and AI, I kind of felt it was coming and, and predicted it a bit in that chapter. And so here we are using this as tools for AI, um, tools for art. And then here's another, um, I was really, I'm in, really into sacred geometry and um, co the cos you know, cosmogram and also um, cosmos in general. So this is where I'm using, um, different um, themes of different uh, ideas from Afrofuturism to produce this image. So this is Tristan Wolf who wrote a medium piece. And I thought these, um, these statements are where we're at now where there's backlash with AI art that here's art but created by machines has no quote unquote human touch. Um, or since AI art is created by machines and not by humans, it therefore does not reflect our creative thought process and does not contain human feelings or human essence. And so this is really kind of what the uh, backlash in some, to some degree and also just uh, ethical um, issues as it relates to copyright and things like that. Um, what I can say, and I wanna talk about this image as it relates to that, um, I was exploring twins. I was wanting to see if Midjourney could give me twins, but with each twin looking different. Um, just, you know, and so I really wanted to see how, how Midjourney would tackle twins and later triplets. And so I came up, this image came up 
Um, and I was using terms like iridescence and um, met metallic and things that had to do with shine because that relates to specular reflection, which some studies, recent studies have shown that you, um, when you light darker skin subjects using specular reflection um, in terms of effects, you get a better image. So I wanted to use that idea and incorporate it in a variety of text prompts to explore that. And so I got this image. Now, if you look at it carefully, you notice that these are clearly twin um, image of twins, but they do look a little different, but they also look like twins. There are other things in this image that are interesting. Um, sacred geometry was one of the prompts. So the earrings are chevrons, or not earrings, the hair ties are chevrons. And there is also a sand dollar um, with some uh, geometric imagery on the uh, person with the, the uh, black t-shirt. But the hair is also really interesting to me because it looks like, you know, crops or something like that. It doesn't, they're not cornrows, they're not braids, but they are definitely unusual. And um, there's also this kind of large braided uh, ornament stuff happening in addition to box braids or regular braids coming down from the bottom. So there's some definitely some odd things happening with this image. And because sacred geometry was one of the prompts, I actually removed the original background and put uh, the flower of life uh, background behind it to really emphasize the geometry um, in this. Um, and so this has on Instagram has 200 likes. And every day there's at least 10. Um, there are people who, uh, 200, um, I said 200, 200,000 likes, it's actually the number. So this Im image has 200,000 likes on Instagram. Um, initially it had about 50,000. And when I shared it again, and just to see what happened, it had, a, it increased in 150,000 likes. And the other thing that's really interesting, people who have no clue about computer graphics, people who have no clue about artificial intelligence or AI art or mid journey or any of that stuff. They think that these twins are real. And so many of the comments that I get on Instagram are about who these twins are. Um, one guy says, you know, you shouldn't make your, you know, make your daughters wear makeup. Um, wait till they get a little older. And I realized he doesn't realize that this is not even, it's not even um, a photograph. This is AI. Uh, and this continues, the comments continue every day. I'm getting comments about these twins, about who they are. Um, one twin looks a little naughty. The other twin looks nicer. Um, another guy who follows me, I didn't realize it until someone tagged me. He took the twins and he created a slide and he asked his followers, which one was the real twin or the real person and which one was not the real twin. And he had a bunch of conversation about who was real, who wasn't. And at some point I'm like, they're all this, it's the same image. And so this is using uh, text prompts and image um, prompts as well to generate this image. So it's using both. You can do that in Mid Journey. And um, then I created and started thinking about Walter, Walter Benjamin, uh, who in the 1930s talked about aura and um, the age of mechanical reproduction. And that I had studied him as a PhD student. And I said, well, what about um, now in the digital age and now the AI age? So I wrote a Medium post about what I had discovered and it went viral, just like the twins, these twin, this image of twins did. That article, I've never had an article that uh, has had that many claps and responses in the time that I've ever used Medium. So, so much so that the Medium staff decided to feature it um, a few weeks ago. And one of the Medium staff on LinkedIn talked about Aura as it relates to the shine of the twins, this appearance of shine or iridescence in the skin as an Aura. But the part I want to point out is human touch. Humans are connecting with these twins in ways that feel personal to them as if they exist in real life. And that was an uh, aha moment for me, is that you can actually produce using AI an image that resonates and touches people in a way that maybe some other images might not using AI. And so um, when we talk about the debate about um, human touch, as I mentioned previously this idea human um, are created by machines has no human touch that's true but people humans can connect with an image like the one i just shared and feel some sort of personal or emotional attachment to the image and i've seen that happen again and again but particularly with this image and also as a medium post and then michael Be michael Bedencourt is talking about 
digital in the digital age aura. And I like this comment because it really captures the moment. And he writes that a spectator's encounter with famous work as an object is distinctly different than their encounter with an unknown work because it is the wide dissemination of that work through reproduction that creates the particular experience. Cultural tourism is based on this idea of encounters with originals whose aura is a function of their being widely reproduced. And, and bold here, the more fully a work is disseminated, the greater its aura. So that comment, that particular quote, I think really refers back to the twins in terms of aura uh, that I mentioned and that it's widely distributed. It's been shared again and again and again and has many different people commenting and liking it. And I think that, that this really captures, is really captured by this quote from My Michael Benincourt. Um, and um, I wanna go also back and talk about Afrofuturism a little bit. Because Afrofuturism exists in the speculative, mostly, it's the idea that we are navigating the past, the present, and the future, kind of sometimes simultaneously or sometimes in a series. But Afrofuturism is um, a cultural movement to some degree, but it's an aesthetic and other um, definitions of it. It's an approach to creating the work. Um, and it has the cosmos. In many cases, we're talking about the universe, we're talking about the cosmos, we're talking about beyond our reality. And other times we're talking about stuff that we um, exist um, in history or in our fantasies and in science fiction. And sometimes they all come together in images. And I feel like this really captures some of those elements um, of Afrofuturism. The other part and this last part, and I know we'll, we'll have lots of conversation and discussion is, um, when navigation is extremely important um, in Afrofuturism, I refer to Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad and how she used uh, this idea, this sort of ongoing um, debate about the use of quilts as signposts and how there are certain signposts, like if you look at quilts as signposts that people use to get from one station on the Underground Railroad to the next, then we like about our GPS systems and the way we tag our locations and how that information and that data is used to create GPS and how we uh, navigate that way. And then this idea of navigation of time and space in our imaginations. And now we're talking about latent space. And this is a new space. This is a space that's submerged with AI art. And that Vox video that I shared earlier really gets into multidimensional space. So now we're moving beyond four dimensions into multidimensional latent space with AI. And what does that mean when we create in latent space as opposed to two dimensions or three dimensions or even four dimensions, which is time-based. And I think that's a new um, development of working and um, really closely with uh, machines and understanding a, a different way of making um, that it has potential to do really cool things in the future. Um, and so um, I think I've thrown a lot out and um, maybe there's some questions and some conversation we can have. And um, you know, people can let me know what you'd like to get more into but I can, uh, I can end there because I, I didn't want to talk too much. I think I, I have a lot of information, so I'll stop and see if there are any questions or comments. Clancy, you're muted. <laughs> okay, that was amazing. Thank you so much. That was really, really great. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet, so I have questions, host's privilege, while you all formulate and type your questions. Um, the first question I had was about um, the way in which you, so it seems like a lot of the practice that you deal with is not necessarily running the algorithms and the computers, but actually working out how to intermediate between the space of how the data is stored and how it's gathered from AI itself. So I'm thinking about uh, the lighting of skin tones, for instance, and then the kinds of codes you can put in to generate that kind of outcome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and I was wondering if, like, how do you actually develop these techniques um, and these languages? Like, what kind of process do you go through to, to sort of work with this data set, um, which has sort of historically been understood I mean, these data sets generally are kind of hostile um, to, to diversity or different ways of thinking. And the hostility and the backlash, again, meant some of it's justified. People are being very intentional about taking from people, um, other artists. So I don't want to take away from their right to, to say, I don't want my images used. 
to make um, AI art. But also there's the technology or the development of being an artist and using the technology itself. And so Deep Dream Generator is a different AI tool. It does not use, it did not until recently use text prompts. And now it has a, and it's a platform. So now it does. And so now I can go back and forth just within Deep Dream Generator between text-based prompts and what I did first, which is image style transfer. Um, so I could take one image and can have three different styles and Deep Dream Generator. And then each time it uses the style, same parameters, the image is different. So if I had a woman and I used the image of cranes and those cranes uh, were from a fabric and they have very angular shapes, the style of the uh, portrait will come out in terms of output very angular versus something more curvy or organic. It would change according to the style. Um, and I got very much into the idea of, of shapes and colors and textures and shine um, before Midjourney, before Dolly 2, and even before, um, you know, at the beginnings of that. And then when I got into the text prompt stuff, then I started to figure out how creatively to reinterpret text or to create text to generate uh, that same effect. And now, like, I'm actually using the same prompts in both platforms. So I'll generate something in Midjourney and then move over to, to uh, into Deep Dream Generator and then use the same prompt. And um, in both cases, I'm trying to uh, see what the output would be. But there's some benefits to Deep Dream Generator that Midjourney does not have, and that's resolution. I can increase the resolution when I generate it again. Um, and do some other things that uh, Midjourney can't do. And of course, Dolly 2, I can do outpainting um, or in painting to make everyone knows about the mangled hands and feet, but there's some ways you can use Dolly 2 to straighten out the hands and feet a little bit better. Um, I tried, it didn't work so well. I prefer to just do it myself by hand in Photoshop, but it's there. So, um, but there's also this idea of call and response that, I have a statement, my statement is my content image, and then there's a response by the machine, and sometimes I'll regenerate or iterate, and the iteration process is, you know, generative as well, where I am asking the machine to generate many different ideas based on a theme, and choosing one that looks better or looks closest to what my imagination is, and so that part is really exciting for me. Um, so, but the people are really going after Mid Journey and Dolly 2 and Stable Diffusion, but Deep Dream Generator predates all that and exists in a different way. So, yeah, okay. fantastic. Thank you. Um, in that time, both the chat and the QA have blown up with questions. So, I'm going to do my best to speak to both of them. Um, although multitasking is not my strongest skill. So, Rita Lucarelli asks, AI is being used to visualize the past, archeological landscapes, for instance, like in Egypt. What do you think about that? Are we then reconstructing a potential past, not the real one? Could that be seen as a form of reenacting ancient art? Interesting. Um, I think in the beginning slides, I talk about how it was a continuation from um, Cubism and Dadaism and some of the isms from pre-1960s pre and, um, and how the idea that the computer was sort of simulating that um, about random randomness and uniqueness being the kind of uh, core to generative art and how that eventually evolved to include AI. Um, and I think that, you know, when we talk about abstraction, um, you'll find that people often talk about those things as it relates to abstraction. And there are very um, abstract processes when we talk about AI. Um, and I think there's some relationship between the machine tool from before there was computers and our ability to use it to to use it to carve out and our imaginations. And now we are having the machine do it and that there's still some kind of back and forth between and that collaboration or that correspondence. That's what Malcolm McCullough talks about a lot is that correspondence between the machine and the person, the tool and the person, the computer and the person. And so, um, which I think touches on stuff that predates um, predates the computer uh, and pre predates AI. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, anonymous attendee, um, first and last name, 
uh, writes, you mentioned that Chantel Martin was upset with her collaborator around the question of the rights of AI. Was her collaborator a human? So what's the question said again? <laughs> so it says, you mentioned that Chantel Martin was upset with her collaborator around the question of the rights of AI. Was her collaborator a human? Her collaborator was an AI. So she worked with Cyrus Sweatman to develop AI and a machine. So you saw the plotter similar to Howard Cohen actually um, and try. And so that's that platform or that tool was used to sort of try to simulate her work or recreate her work. Um, she was curious about the output. Can it happen? I'm sure she was excited by the, the idea, but as it became more about the AI and less about the artist, she did not like that at all. It moved away from the human and then less, it was less about her, who was the artist and more about the machine. And that's really where she drew, took, it took issue with. That's, that's fascinating. And I am not gonna follow up, ask follow up questions because there are other people who have questions. It's just going a lot of self-restraint happening here. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, the next question is how difficult is it learn is it to learn mid-journey and Dali for someone who's not post savvy? Um, they have tons of um, videos on YouTube about how to get started with mid-journey. So some of them are great, some aren't. Um, I didn't use any of those tutorials. Uh, I Someone tagged me on Facebook at, about mid-journey and said, look what I'm doing. You might want to check it out. So I got, first I was curious and then I said, oh, I got to set up a server on Discord. I have Discord, but I don't really use it. So I was going to turn away, but then I was so curious. So I kept trying. And then I kind of maybe found some steps somewhere and um, set up a server and then just started putting text prompts in and seeing what happened. Um, after a while, Mid Journey Spot realized, so there's a couple of things that happened for, to me. One, after the first 25 uh, images you create, you're no, it's no longer free. So you get 25. So either you're hooked or you're not. So I was hooked mostly because I just want to keep experimenting just like with Deep Dream Generator. So I did get a $30 a month membership. And then it said, okay, you're serious about this. You got it. We boot, we're booting you out of the newbie channel. You can no longer use the newbie channel. You got to use your own personal server. So I could not even create any more images or generate images with prompts in the main um, area, I had to go create my own private server, use my private server. And so it booted me there. So, and that's fine. Um, but I just found it interesting um, as I went along. But uh, uh, for Deep Dream Generator, uh, similar idea. I just started to, I uploaded an image. They have their own uh, library of images you could try for, for styles. And then I realized after time, they kept adding features and it got better and better. And I just kept going. So I just jumped in. But again, you know, in my exposure to technology is through my mother, who was a programmer. And so I was never afraid of computers. I just didn't know you could use them for art until high school. And so once that was the case, then I was able to sort of bring that into my reality. Um, but both these, I, I don't know about Deep Dream Generator, but Mid Journey and Dolly 2 have plenty of tutorials on YouTube, um, maybe Vimeo, about how to get started and how to use it. Yeah, and my experience as well has been that the biggest barrier is actually just the cost of the computation. Yes. It's, you know, these are massive um, data sets that are being run and no one wants to give away that kind of processing for free for very long if they can help it. Yes. Um, so, um, okay. Oh, could an artist uh, gen create AI images from family genealogy prompts or genealogy prompts? So if you put in... Yeah, it's possible. Um, it's the kind of question I would just do. I would just try it out, just like the twins. Can it do twins that don't look exactly like it? You know, the same image copied um, for subtle differences. And so I would say try it out. You've got twenty five chances before you have to pay. Right, so. twenty. You got twenty five times, but then you can also use Deep Dream Generator, which yes. is also free up to a point. Um, it doesn't give you a number, but there is uh, some limitations to how much you can do. Um, so Tamika Grooms asks, this is, do you see AI being able to create any sort of sequential art in the near future, say book illustrations or storyboards? 
it's already happening. Um, there's something called Movie Machine that allows you to use Mid Journey to do animations, and there's tutorials out about it. So um, it's very time consuming and does require some knowledge of coding um, in addition, and also possibly Photoshop, uh, Adobe After Effects, um, which is another tool. So it's already, there's already stuff out that you can find about doing animation. So it's sequential artist here. Um, so FD Scott asks, I don't know how to code and probably won't learn. Can you recommend an AI that I can try out where the data set is only of my art and photography? You could use, I did some, some stuff with P5JS. I found some uh, uh, tutorial on YouTube about using it to create generative art and using your own artwork. You can, you know, act on it um, in the code, uh, but it requires some knowledge of JavaScript and some coding um, or following the tutorial and learning the coding that way. Uh, but it is possible, but you have to use, you do have to do some coding. I think um, runway machine learning allows you to up so upload your own data sets. Mm -hmm. well. Yes, it does. But and they've know, changed but... it. Runway's changed a lot since it first, it doesn't even look like a machine learning uh, platform anymore. Oh, it's slick. You kind of got to go in the background to find it. Yeah. They're going after bucks, the big bucks. <laughs> Isn't everyone? Yeah. Um, so... Zachary Rondo says, how is the industry of creating generative AI software being affected by the backlash and legitimacy of labeling AI generated art as art like Chantel Martin, Chantel Martin wrote about? Yeah, Chantel Martin, she uses digital tools. I mean, in the same exhibition, she's got stuff she did on the iPad as well as stuff she did at pen and ink. Um, and it's generative, it's procedural. It's, not, it's close to generative, but it's procedural definitely where she's going through a series of steps to produce these drawings. Um, I've, I consider myself, I can, uh, I have a fine arts background. So I have schooling in um, drawing and painting and sculpture, but I also choose digital tools to make art as primarily. And so um, there's a difference between me who I'm perfectly happy in the digital space only. And then someone like Chantel who doesn't necessarily have to, and often does not, exist in the space of the digital when she makes her work. Um, once you move on to the digital side, there are artists who take stock photos and collage them. They mix it with their own photos, their images. So it's really whatever inspires them. Even before Mid Journey um, and Dolly 2 and Staple Diffusion, artists were using other pieces, other works um, to build on. And it's just part of whatever you want as the output or the, the final work. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. So the next question from Emma Fraser is, there's like 28 questions. We're going to- It's okay. We can do what we can. can. <laughs> um, is, thank you so much for all this material to think with. I was fascinated with the Benjaminian angle. Benjamin also describes aura as uniqueness and the apparition of distance. Would you think perhaps the unique images of the twins and others that can be generated through AI art slash generative AI and so on also potentially have this kind of effect that strikes us, which Benjamin attributes to original works of art because of the way it can does generate impactful aesthetic works differently to the repetition of the same, which defines the mass production of the image. Yeah, and I think the, the this guy, Hans Abing and uh, Benincourt take uh, Ben Hamid's work and bring it into the 20th century, you know, bring it into the 20th century, 21st century with the digital art. Um, any considerations in terms of, because um, he didn't wrote that in the 1930s and did not consider machines as, you know, computers and mechanical as computers. Um, aura, you know, is different in each era. So the aura of the, photo of the photograph and the print in terms of printmaking, is different than what, and he was looking at paintings and other types of things in galleries and museums and, and com comparing and contrasting with mechanical production and reproduction specifically. And so that was a different time period. And so then you have to look at a new different, and he also says that as the era changes, the aura changes in the same essay. 
Then you got John Berger in Ways of Seeing, and he looks at Ben Amina too. And he had a TV series that um, was BBC or not, but he had a TV series and a book about it. And he includes R in that book as it relates to that time period. So 20, 30 years later. And then of course, now we're, we're here. Um, the R situation I think is different in a digital space than it is in a mechanical reproduction space. And I also think um, as with the twins, Aura can also exist as it relates to how the viewer um, interprets the work or feels towards the work. And so in this case, this Aura, the twins Aura is something that look at as it relates to an AI latent space. But the uniqueness part is across the board. Uniqueness and randomness for generative art, we can look at uniqueness also from Ben Amin's point of view when it relates to this work. This is a good segue into the next question which is, can you talk a little bit more about the multidimensional latent space and what it is and what its potential is? Like, how do you understand that concept? Yeah, no, the way that I understand it is the way in which the AI uh, processes images is where the latent space is. There's this, um, I know that AI makes predictions. So it makes predictions about what's, what needs to happen. So any, like for example, in mid journey, if I put, put in a prompt, it gives me four thumbnails. And then I can reiterate, can iterate that or reiterate it, and it will give me another four thumbnails. And before long, I can have twenty. Um, I can make variations on one of the image thumbnails before I even get to the finished output. So then I have all these variations of images that are generated from one prompt. So I couldn't do that in two dimensions. I couldn't do that in three dimensions and four four dimensions time based. But it I can do that in multiple dimensions where they're all in that video, the Vox, I'll put it in the chat, talks about how that would happen with a banana and another piece of fruit and how the AI figures out how to see, not see, but how to understand those two separate images and where to place it in the space. It's happening behind the scenes so quickly, we don't even see it happen. It happens almost instantaneously, but that's this reality, the space. So how can it, an AI who can't see with eyes, can it determine through binary code or numbers, how can it understand that we want a banana versus a grape? How can it understand that whole in-between of small banana, banana small enough, could be a grape, colors, yellow, one is yellow, one is purple. That's where the latent space comes in. It's all these possibilities and the AI figuring it out. Um, and that's uh, where the video I mentioned gets more into that. So I think it's really interesting this idea that we can't look at it from our own eyes. We have to understand that there's space beyond that um, in many different dimensions as it relates to generating the work. Sorry, I'm just taking it. Right. Um, okay, Manuel from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania here. How does one develop their own style? Is it by using a particular set of keywords every single time? So if I use keywords or prompts and currently, and I don't pay the $60 to have a private, 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 private. Um, so if you want, you can go find my prompts and use them. You'll never be able to duplicate what I made initially from that because I, you know, because you can't, I can't duplicate it myself. I can get it close, but I can't duplicate that exact image. So um, the, it, it's really the uniqueness of it that I like. Um, that image is unique in itself. I can't reproduce it but I can get close to it or I can, um, and, I'm, and here's the other thing I meant to say during the talk, it is not my intention to copy an artist. I never, ever, ever use an artist's name or work in my text prompts. And people can go behind the scenes and see that that's the case. There are always gonna be um, things like styles or aesthetics or like watercolors or particular, um, you know, um, chiaroscuro, which is, you know, from the, from the Renaissance times or whatever, but I'm not going to be saying Caravaggio. I don't want to create a Caravaggio. I want to create my own, you know, and respond and create my own work. So the aesthetic ar arrives out of experimentation. As I experiment, I get certain output, I continue to explore the output and sometimes expand on it. As I'm expanding on it, I begin to choose certain styles. For example, in Deep Dream Generator, um, when I want to create a, a shine or specular reflection in, in, a, um, in a subject, I use the same styles over again. And I know the parameters because they can always go back and check. So that work is 
not easily copied and it's specific to me and it has nothing to do with prompts. It has to do with what I imagine in my art artist's eye. I'm actually gonna drop down to the question after the next, just because I think it ties in, which is mm -hmm. um, how are you thinking through the ethical questions then behind the databases making images? So, you know, you've obviously got the WikiArt database, um, but of course there's a lot of controversy over the lack of diversity in Celeb A and Celeb HQ data sets, which were used to inform a lot of um, deep fake software. Um, so again, that's mid journey. I use Deep Dream Generator, which isn't that same technology. When I use both, um, there are issues around, of course, it, using images that are, you know, possibly. So the, the part I have is that depending on how you sit on the spectrum, you're thinking that the AI is specifically going out to choose artwork as opposed to anything tagged butterfly. So I'm not looking for a butterfly from MC Escher. I'm just looking for butterflies, anything with the alt tag or tag butterfly. And so all the, and, and then the AI is just trying to understand all that information and find the commonalities and say, here's a butterfly or here's, you know, and then let me incorporate it the way you asked in the text prompt. Same with hair, same with skin, skin same with, you know, many other th um, elements of an image. And so I think the AI itself is not dumb, but it doesn't, intentionally go out it has it's very you have to be really intentional to create an image like picasso you have to put in picasso you have to put in certain things that relate to picasso now as it relates to how it scrapes and how it finds images we know that it finds images where the data sets are trained so sometimes the data set is trained but had to be trained again and are retrained um, on other data sets um, the data sets that different tools use are different so stable diffusion exists in Deep Dream Generator now, but you can choose not to use stable diffusion in Deep Dream Generator. It says it, there's stable diffusion and then there's not. Use these other models. Uh, so there's a, a drop-down menu that says um, multiple, um, it'll have multiple models in it. So you choose a training model. Each training model is going to grab images differently, grab elements differently. Yeah. Now you don't have that in mid-journey yet, but I imagine soon, that that's going to have to happen in some of these other tools. So you can actually choose the training model set now if you use um, Deep Dream Generator, um, and that will impact how your images are generated. Do you have to, if you're looking to that picture with the twins, do you mm -hmm. actually try to um, create people? Do you have to um, give a sense of what kind of like ethnicity or cultures or like how do you actually deal with that kind of input that you're trying to draw from? Um, so like, would you say, you know, two black girls or? Sometimes, twins. So I'll say golden twins, golden black twins or golden twin black. girls, right. women. Um, yeah. I'm, it's all in how I define, you know, how I imagine it should be. And I may have experimented a little bit and I realized that, okay, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So I'll just keep using that prompt. Um, and if I need more guidance to the AI, I will upload an image, a stock photo, a photo of mine, like this, but yeah. with these um, elements, these aspects. And so that can happen in, in, in mid journey as well. It's a fascinating kind of poetry. I'm totally obsessed with like the poetry of like the world. And you know what mid journey does may not even look anything like the photo, but now it has more information. Okay, yeah. you mean twins with locks or twins with straight hair, or twins with curly hair, or twins with braids. So it has a little more information to, in this late space of generation to add, to create that image. Hmm. Um, so Tonya Wright asks, can Natrice share more about how she got interested in AI? Um, she mentioned she was a teacher wanting to explore computer graphics. Was that the first time or an introduction? How does your work in VR relate to that as well? Um, I, um, no, I had my first VR headset in the late 1990s. <laughs> it's true. And I didn't like the games that it had. It was, you know, 1990s era, whatever. And I didn't like it on my face. So, um, and at the time I bought it because I was teaching kids coding and I wanted them to explore VR. And so that was uh, 98, maybe? 98, 99. Um, so I used it for a little bit and then I got a lost interest and put it in the cabinet um, and eventually moved on to Massachusetts. But um, 
I got in, I wanted to, so all of the students that I had in my AP computer science principals class were art majors. So they went there, I was at an art high school with a STEAM lab and AP computer science met in the STEAM lab. So in any given day, you would have music majors would take um, data visual data information and compose to it so that it would the compo, compo, the notes would be high where it was high, low where it was low. Then you had, um, so I thought when we get to the section on AI and data and information, what tools exist to convey or show, demonstrate how data information works today? And that's how I found Deep Dream. And then I did it, I used it, introduced it to the students, and then some of them played around with it. But I personally, as the artist part of me, started to use it too. And then I just kept going. So it did begin, all of that, even the VR was because I was working with young people and wanted them to have access to and be able to use these new emerging uh, technologies. So do you have any thoughts on how to approach the teaching, teaching the basics of AI slash machine learning art to the general public within a media arts context? Any helpful resources? It's been really interesting. I, without people informing me, I've found schools, I've found young people in after school programs who decide to use my work as uh, inspiration and then do their own work. Um, then you can see their images that they come up with. The idea of doing portraiture in a way that reflects as I've you know, done that locally here in Boston, Massachusetts, but um, with young people, but also seen other people do it. Um, when we think about how we want the world to see us versus what, how, how, like if I take a photo of myself, like the Greg Tate image. When I did the Greg Tate image, it was a selfie initially, but I wanted to bring in some of the aspects of what I was doing in AI to show kind of an, um, an Afrofuturistic Greg Tate. Um, and it took, so people really respond and now it's a mural that people can see every day um, up until April. <laughs> but at the same time, the whole idea is it's another version of Greg Tate. It's another, I could have multiple versions of Greg Tate, um, you know, but this was what, this was uh, what I was doing at the time. And I think for, for young people, the idea that you can create, and someone mentioned Linza in the chat and I don't really, I had, and then when Linza came out, someone had said to me, you know, Natrice, you don't even need to use Linza. You, you've been, you're, you've been doing way beyond what Linza can do for a long time. And I don't, I have no particular interest, but for the, the consumer and someone who isn't um, trained in art school or hasn't been practicing and using AI for years, this is a way to sort of explore it. And, and it's kind of entertaining, silly side or, you know, curious side. But the dangers are there, right? So what what's the data set? What's the training model? All those things still play. And um, I don't know enough about Linza because I don't use it. Um, I've stayed mostly in the uh, mid-journey um, Deep Dream Generator. But you know, again, just like Deep Dream Generator gives you an option of training models to use. That's where we need to be, where you can move and use ch choose the training data set that works for you, that you feel like is more ethical than the other. Okay, thank you. Moving on to Afrofuturism, FD Scott says, I love your explanation of Afrofuturism. For the record, I did too. Um, do any of your books slash articles cover Afrofuturism in more detail? Or do you recommend any books or articles? Um, well, there's uh, Itasha um, Womack's original book, the first published book on Afrofuturism. Um, and then there's Afrofuturism 2.0, which <laughs> has two volumes. So I'm in the first volume in chapter two and I'm looking at vernacular space and what I really was trying to talk about what that didn't have the words for it was latent space. Mm. Um, but I started to get there through the Harry Tubman and the, the uh, Underground Railroad and talking about GPS, looking at virtual worlds like Second Life, all that stuff and how you navigate you know, as an avatar. I was starting to get there, but, um, but yeah, so that's another version of Afrofuturism is looking at space, time and space in the virtual, as opposed to re, uh, the physical reality. Um, so there are many, those are some examples. There's some films out um, that you can find reference in these books, but I think that's a good start. Um, so, hi, exclamation mark. You mentioned that the audience is able to build emotional connections with the AI generated pieces. Could you elaborate on more whether or not the artists also develop emotional attachment with these AI generated works, knowing that they can be they are created by machines? In other words, how can artists build personal connections with AI generated artworks? 
I think, you know, um, I've often said, you know, it, around the time when I did the Greg Tay, I was telling people and people told me that the image was therapeutic. It was helping them to grieve and to mourn Greg Tay. Um, and the Greg Tate's band met in front of the mural and I flew from Boston to New York just to be with them. And people were hugging me with tears. It meant so much to have him over their shoulders in the photos, he was still part of them. Um, I was creating images that were therapeutic to me helping me to understand loss during COVID. So I was doing all kinds of images of people who had passed away. And it was therapeutic to create these images and then share them with others. Um, who then responded in kind um, to that. But this was different. This was, I generated an image on the idea of what I was trying to get to speculative reflection. And I said, what about twins? And once it generated, I had four up. And then out of the four up, I had to choose one. I mean, I don't have to choose, but I choose one. There was one I knew right away. And that was the image. I said, look at that. And then I had you generate it to make it larger. Once I did that, it struck me. And I said, I have to share that. And um, so there are images I feel compelled to share because it strikes me in a certain way emotionally. And then oftentimes it strikes others emotionally as well. It's a feeling. And that's where the human part comes in. Hey, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, Bob Dylan's son, Jesse, and I had a Zoom call once and I introduced Mid Journey to Jesse. And Jesse said, there's a difference between you and I. I can generate 100 AI images using Mid Journey. You can generate, but I have no clue what images to choose that would be you know, considered art or look good. You, I can't, I have no clue. And that and you, and, you, know, you can look an instant and be able to tell which one um, would resonate or which one makes sense. There's something kind of interesting as well in that curatorial process of choosing images. As well, I think you know one of the things that AI does is generate many, 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 um, kind of beyond the scope that you know a person can actually sort of see. So actually, being able to pick out certain images and go, these say something. And I would say Deep Dream Generator is more artists as collabor and collaborating with AI, and Mid Journey mm -hmm. is more as artists as as a uh, curator. Yeah, yeah. And then you um, can merge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or sort of stack them and, and with yes. Photoshop. <laughs> um, Griffin Maguire writes, fantastic talk. I wonder what your thoughts are on how traditional painters slash artists can incorporate this into physical processes. I've seen a ton of digital work done incorporating digital work, and I found the mural made earlier in the talk to be very unique. So what about the process from digital to physical? Well, you have the ceramics with Leah Buck Bickley, um, where she was taking the code and embedding it into the clay. Um, but I also know some artists, this guy, Tony Perrier, he in Los Angeles, he actually did something in Deep Dream Generator and then he painted it in oils. And when I saw his progress, I knew he had done the, he used Deep Dream Generator because the style came out in the painting. So his rendition in oil actually still had elements of what you would get in Deep Dream Generator. And I asked him, and, hey, is that Deep Dream Generator? So yeah, I did use that to generate the image initially. So um, it crossed over in the oil painting. So some artists are already doing that. They're bringing in elements of their AI generated Im images into their oil painting or into their ceramics or other types of work. Um, it's already happening. And architects are using it too to generate possible models. And they can do a hundred at a time as opposed to a slower process and then start curating that. I'd love to see the, um, you know, the physical models, the workshop models that architects built um, made out of, from the deep dream sort of generators yes. or mid journeys, like actually just, actually, yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay, so the next question, how are there more questions? So there's 29 questions now. We may not get it to everyone. Okay, um, that's fine. I think it's very flattering that Natrice is very popular, but you're also in quite a strange time zone, aren't you? You're in the East Coast. Uh, it's it's 9.30 p.m. here. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you to bed on time. Um, <laughs> That's okay, I'm, I'm a night owl, I'm fine. <laughs> um, someone, anonymous attendee, um, number two, three, asks, how about algorithmic justice and honoring the artists the systems are built from? What other challenges do you see moving forward? Um, I wrote a paper on um, algorithmic bias and, it, and the history of it um, for Just Tech, which is the Social uh, Sciences Research Council. 
And it was commissioned to look at, a, it was a field report looking at the field at the time, which is a year ago now, um, things have changed. Um, and also we teach at Leslie University where I work, we did two summers ago an art AI robotics course. And I showed them coded bias, which looks at algorithmic justice specifically. And looking at uh, the negative, we look at both, even in uh, AP computer science, we look at both the harms and the benefits of AI so that we are aware we go in, we can be more ethical in our choices. And so um, Coded Bias being a great movie to watch it was on Netflix, but um, also it was really great for students, to, young high school students to be able to look at it, think about it, reflect on it as they're creating their own using, um, in Scratch, uh, creating, uh, using machine learning. Um, it was really good for them to see that as they were thinking about doing that. So, um, you know, we have some movies, we have books, we have, but we have, you know, some really good stuff. Um, there's uh, tons of stuff coming out all the time about this stuff. Um, Stephanie Dinkins has some talks about her uses of uh, robotics and AI. So there's lots of examples. I didn't mention it in the slides, but I probably should have, but I collaborated with Valencia James and Vernell um, Noel, uh, who's an architect on looking at Trinidad Carnival and if we could uh, incorporate and celebrate Carnival using AI and we use P5JS and we use PoseNet to do it, which also came out of Google. This is body uh, key points in the body and drawing with the body, movement of the body. Um, so um, that's another element of dance and, and performance that we explored about a year and a half ago. Um, so Zachary Rondos asks, uh, what is your artistic process and how has it evolved as you started doing more generative art? For example, you mentioned the learning curve when using DDG. So actually how has it shifted um, over time? Um, I showed my first, I, I like to show, I showed my first ever AI piece in DDG generator um, versus where I am at now. And I, you know, and it's just, I think the process of doing it every day, every day for 365 days, that becomes a practice. It becomes habit. And not so much habit, but something that is part of a day. It's a routine. And um, in order to master this stuff, you kind of really have to um, do it often. <laughs> and I'd say you have to do that with any tool. You have to use it often to master. So the same thing with AI. Um, and again, the ethical issues are there and being aware that training models are there, but also being aware that there are many AI tools and they don't always have to do with text prompts and they don't always use stable diffusion and they don't always use some of these other models that can be problematic like Linza. And so really understanding that and also being intentional about it where even in your prompts, you don't reference any Star Wars, no Pokemon, no Picasso, no, none of that, um, that you are really just exploring this general to create something unique. Um, so. Um, so another Benjaminian question, um, Aura, you mentioned Aura, you get questions. Um, so John Ursek writes, Walter Benjamin's concept of the Aura was presented as a form of mysticism that was leveraged as a form of power that traditional artists of the time tried to leverage over the new mass media art forms, film or photography. He was excited by the idea that these new forms would not have an aura and be a possible form of revolution for the masses. Instead, it seems that his concept of aura was wrong, that even new forms of art have an aura, based upon your answer to Emma Fraser's question earlier. Um, so the questions are, one, does the contemporary art world still use aura or do they describe it as something else now? And two, it seems to me that aura is controlled more by the audience than it is by the artists or the presenters of the art. Would you lean one way or the other or in a third way in regard to these possibilities? Um, again, it comes down, I'm gonna put this in the chat. Um, this is the uh, Vox thing about latent space. And I think, think considering that, and we talk about aura is important, um, because I think we're talking about a whole new paradigm shift in terms of how we make images. And I think it's important to remember that what even Michael Bittencourt and Hans Abing wrote was for a different type of digital art than we're talking about today. And so we're in the very beginnings of theorizing what that means in terms of aura. 
I have a particular point of view and I use twins as an example because it's viral and it and I don't know why it's viral. Every day someone's in there commenting and they're all fresh and sometimes people point, post Bible verses. I don't know. It is resonating with people in ways that's beyond me. And I don't know why, because there's little things that I noticed that are very odd about the image that people don't seem to notice. Um, and when they do, um, it's still, you know, they still like the image. So it's just, um, I'm still new and thinking about what this means, what is the impact of this work? And so this is a new territory, a new, uh, a new um, wild, wild west, <laughs> so to speak, of, of art. Um, and, uh, and again, a real paradigm shift in terms of image making. I put the quote, I put the medium post in the aura and has interesting comments in it. Um, people, people commenting, arguing, debating, yelling at each other uh, with and without me. And then the Vox thing on latent space and the whole trajectory um, as it relates to text to image is in there as well. And Valencia, yeah, she put the project, the Carnival AI project in there as well. Uh, okay. So, well, um, so there seems to be increasing numbers of questions. <laughs> what I might do is try and um, summarize three themes that I might get you to speak a little bit more about from these um, many kind of questions. The first is around um, the um, relationship between artificial intelligence, uh, teaching uh, as well, education, and um, the question of race. So the way in which artificial intelligence and algorithms and, you know, they're not necessarily deep dream, um, but um, surveillance software, et cetera, have been used. Um, and then how do you, what tools and further education do you need to actually enrich um, sort of, uh, sort of teaching in that area. So one, you know, how do you balance that? Two, um, there's a lot of artists. Um, there's a whole conversation happening here. Two is actually how um, could we extend the question of AI art? Um, so thinking, for instance, about um, the creation of interactive spaces, world building, um, and how does that relate to like latent spaces um, that you've been talking about? Um, someone sort of mentions the metaverse, for instance. Um, so yeah, there's one sort of race reclaiming AI teaching, two um, using art as a kind of world AI as a kind of world building practice in latent space. And three, um, something about, uh, I haven't seen a question like this one yet. Some of them sort of repeating questions that have gone before, environmental um, impacts of AI as well. Um, so I think those are the three. Um, and someone is working very hard to connect you with the USCB media arts program, specifically Allosphere. So. <laughs> So um, there's some um, posts out there. I'll put this in. There's a about latent space. Um, there's this. It's a scary image that someone generated from latent space. If you just leave it alone and type in one word, um, and part of that is a no brainer for me. If you put in some generic word, it doesn't have any. Of course, the AI doesn't know what this means. It's going to create something scary. It doesn't know what to grab onto. Um, for me, it's it's like yeah, duh. Um, so that article that's there. It, talks about use, seeing what the nature of latent space is as if there's some scary thing sitting out in the latent space who's ready to scare us. But if you type in that word, lobe, <laughs> or whatever the word is, yeah, it's gonna give what it thinks it should be and it's not gonna necessarily be uh, a beautiful image. Um, and I think that's, you know, negative prompts, sure, you know, but I also think the intention of the artist is something that AI cannot do. It is the intention of the artist that explores the randomness and the uniqueness of the AI space versus the person who is a non-artist who just wants to see what happens when you mix Pokemon with Darth, Darth Vader. Um, is it art? 
that can be debated, but it definitely is an image and it's definitely something that other people may enjoy. Um, and there are people who enjoy the, you know, the scary image in that article, Loeb, who thinks that's really cool and disturbing. But then there's also being intentional about when we're looking for something that strikes uh, the emotions in a certain way. And that's something that a machine cannot do. And that's what makes, that's the human touch. That's the human inter intervention. That's the human's role in this process is being able to determine what that image is or what direction to take the AI in. Um, we can't rely so much on these training models and tools without the role of the artist in that process. And it becomes very easy for non-artists and for critics to ignore the role of the artist in this process because they don't think the artists are important. There is a fear for artists that artists will continue to be marginalized because of this ability to easily put Pokemon and Darth Vader together. But the actual artists probably wouldn't do that unless they were commissioned. So where we're standing, it hasn't changed much in the sense that some people still um, marginalize the role of the artist without realizing that some of these amazing images are because of the artist, because it strikes a feeling that there's emotion or there's a feeling or there's an intention. And so these things are important in the process of getting to imagery that might have aura yeah. today in, in the AI space. Yeah. And there's a question of agency there as well that you know, absolutely ai which kind of attends i think to some of the questions and debates around um absolutely sort of policing and algorithmic methods and stuff like that yeah. um, um okay i do want to get you out of here relatively soon um i think there's a lot going on in here um a lot of comments um Yeah, I think we should just get you back okay. at some point to answer all these questions. Um, so one final question um, from Adetunji on Amade. I'm going to combine it with a question from uh, Adrian Montefar. Um, so the first question is, can AI art be used to generate or reimagine depictions of historical characters. You know, you discuss or you talk about Harriet Tubman. Could you use AI to reimagine Harriet Tubman? But by the same token, um, Adrian Montefar asks, you know, a lot of these images are designed specifically to be striking. What is the role for a boring image, one that is not striking? Um, I did some, several Harriet Tubmans. <laughs> um. <laughs> One of the Harry Tubman is for an opera that I got commissioned by the Boston Modern um, Orchestra Project and um, an opera program to create, every year they're gonna put out uh, an opera around some, either a black activist or a black hero or something like that. So this year it was Malcolm X. It'll be a few years, it'll be Martin Luther King. I did a Harry Tubman, uh, Frederick Douglass and so on and so um, I did a Harriet Tubman for Miss Magazine when it was, um, you know, last year when we talked uh, Harriet Tubman, it was a key year. So Miss Magazine did a feature and I did the Harriet Tubman illustration for that. Uh, so I've had, and I used Deep Dream Generator and then the other one I used uh, Deep Dream Generator, but then I recently made one in um, the journey. So which that I like a lot. So I have created some of these um, both personally in social media and others in public so the uh, Malcolm X cover with the AI art is up for a Grammy this year um, and best operatic uh, performance. So, you know, it's out there, it's there. And just a quick note, each one of my clients, they uh, get permission to use that source image, that content image. They get the permissions, whether it's Smithsonian or the BMLP for the opera project, they all get the permissions before I even go. They tell me which images are 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 fine to use, um, and so and then at that point I go to town. Um, same with the uh, book covers for Harper Collins. So it's all you know, ethical. Hmm. And again, I'm not trying to do it in the style of an artist. I'm trying to do the shine and all the other effects that I've been <laughs> playing around with. Um, but yeah, I love that one is up for a Grammy. 
Um, uh, there's a Harper Collins book. There's a mural in Brooklyn. It's so many different ways in which this work is being consumed and and viewed and expressed and experienced. It's extraordinary. Okay, I think we're going to leave it on that note. Um, thank you to Dr. Gaskins, first of all, for such an illuminating and enthralling discussion. Um, I've won them enthralled, as are 65 people who actually stayed past the time um, <laughs> during what is dinner time on this end <laughs> of the country. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's been a really wonderful talk. Um, I'm so glad that we got to do this. This is just fantastic. Thank you for having me. <laughs>